Good morning, everyone. Gather on in. Well, fellowship is a good thing, too, so I enjoy seeing that. The, the best thing I've seen on Facebook in a long time was this. The world plans for war while heaven is planning for a wedding. Talking about that great wedding uh, celebration, bridegroom Jesus will receive us, his bride, the church. Such a hopeful word in this time of anxiety and despair. Uh, we know the end of the book. It's going to be okay. It doesn't mean we can't be distressed and carry this burden for our world and our nation, but let's, uh, let's not lose heart. Let's keep looking to Jesus and find comfort and strength in him. So the question, in light of that, in light of this future, what kind of people ought we to be? People of hope and courage and faithfulness. We ought to be representing Jesus well to a world that really is looking for answers. So I think God's going to help us with that. It's not up to us to figure it all out. He's given us his word in this time to help us become the people he's calling us to be. I'm glad you've gathered. I greet you in Christ's name. I welcome our live stream audience. I'm so glad you've tuned in. If you're new to us, I encourage you to take a moment and fill out the uh, connect form on your bulletin. Uh, this place for prayer requests to inquire about more information. And there's a similar form on our website. So please take a moment and fill that out. And you can uh, drop the connect cards and an offering uh, box on your way out. Well, this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, but it's not just about the ashes. Um, that's an optional activity to have ashes imposed upon you. Don't, there's no pressure to do so. We're going we're gonna to do some fun things with rocks and with lint brushes, and, and most importantly, we're going to prepare our hearts for uh, this holy season of pressing into Jesus. That's what it's about. The six weeks um, between now and Easter are a time of preparation, a time of uh, introspection, of, of opening our hearts up to God. It's a good thing to do. Uh, George Manor and I were talking about this, and, and we need this as a church. We need to press into Jesus. We need to Listen to his voice. Quiet some of the noise in our lives. So I, I encourage you to join us this Wednesday at 6.30. Uh, we'll sing. We'll pray. There'll be some activities. Uh, we're going to live stream our Ash Wednesday service. So if you're not able to join us in person, I hope you'll, you'll join us on the live stream. We've been blessed the last November, December, January, four months to have a, a sharp young man named Kobe Levon fill in while our youth pastor is still convalescing, recovering from his shoulder surgery, Kobe's going to come and uh, read the call to worship. But uh, I just want to thank you for being available, for being obedient. Uh, preached some great sermons, and I'm sure taught some great lessons, and uh, filled the critical need. We, got, we have another few weeks before Tori returns to us, uh, trusting the Lord to help us in the next month. But thank you, Kobe, for your service among us. Thank you, Pastor Dave, for this opportunity. It's been awesome. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 92. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. Join me and let's pray. Father God, we're so thankful, Lord, um, to be able to come into your house. God, that through the worship, we would be reminded of the joy of our salvation, Lord. And as we sing these songs, we would be able to lift up your holy name, God. Lord, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I did forget uh, a ministry moment, an uh, important part of our uh, Lenten season. So go ahead, George. So I'm George. Um, 
I bought you these books this year again, so you can pray for the next 40 days. I think about this, and I think about a story that happened in my life a few years ago. One night, my son calls me from Kentucky, and it's about 11 o'clock his time, and he says, my car won't start. What do, what do you think? And I says, well, what does it do? And he says, well, the lights get dim. And I says, did you check the oil? And he says, I will when I stop. So it tells me that his oil was probably low and his engine blew up, but I'm not sure. So the mindset is, is your car engine needs oil to work. It's lube to keep the engine running. Well, prayer ministry needs lube to keep it working, and the lube is prayer. So we come to pray, not for ourselves, but we gather. It's, it's just a mindset that something's got to keep ministry moving forward and upward so it works smoothly. If you don't have any oil in your engine, it doesn't work very well at all. So what? it's got to be prayer that keeps ministry working. If we don't have prayer, then we're doing it in our own power and our own might, and it's going to blow up, and we can't have that. Jesus doesn't want us to have that. So I got you these. They start on Wednesday. They're on the table back there. Pick one up. One per family. There's not a whole lot of them. Um, we'll probably use them Wednesday night, I'm guessing, to some degree. And it's just a mindset to put us in prayer because you get to pray every day, and there's a whole list of things. You pray for the church. You pray for a country or two every day. In, in the end of 40 days, we pray for all the countries in the world through this. And it helps us draw near to God because, as I spoke about the engine needing oil, I need heaven's oil to fill me up so I can do what I need to do. Pastor needs heaven's oil so he can stay in the right place with what God has for him to do, and so do all the rest of us. And so I just think it's a really neat book, and they got really good ideas, and you don't have to con can figure out how to pray for that day. It tells you what to pray. You read the scripture, and you pray over that stuff. So it's like just take one, have fun, and enjoy the next 40 days. Let's consecrate ourselves for what's going to happen on Palm Sunday and thereafter in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thanks, George. Appreciate it. It's good. Good to see you, brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm glad you're here. And I'm ready to worship the Lord. How about you? Is he good in your life? He is the Lord of all, and we have come to worship him. Let's stand together and confess that Christ has died. Christ is risen. But Christ is coming again. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's praise.
is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. When we praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. this morning. We praise you this morning, Jesus. You are God of all. His word says we do not fight against flesh and blood, but the principalities of darkness. So it's time to put your armor on this morning, folks. Get the battle to the Lord. When all I see is a battle, do you see my vision?
Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God.
Yes, Lord. We're going to transition to a time of prayer and open the altars to you this morning. But I'm encouraged uh, by the words. Uh, I kind of told Pastor when I selected the songs this week, it wasn't necessarily didn't feel divinely inspired, but I believe that it actually has been, that those are the words that I needed to hear this morning, that in spite of the chaos that exists around me and in my own life, um, he is still Lord of all. And he is the one that we can depend on and trust in. And I believe that this morning. And I needed that, Lord. Thank you. Even when I didn't realize you were speaking to my heart, you were. Uh, you knew what I needed today. So thank you. You are a good God. Um, we are going to come together. And uh, yeah, let's lift up. There's plenty of needs, right? I, there, there's no shortage of things to pray for this morning. So let's come together. And if you can, I invite you to come forward and kneel. And let's just gather together as a body of believers and ask our Lord uh, to be in the service and to speak to us this morning, but also um, first hand of protection and blessing on those that need it and encouragement, all of that uh, God calls us to this morning. So uh, let's declare our need for him. We're singing the chorus one more time. Would you come and join me at the altars and let's pray to the Lord. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. And to kneel at the front chairs if we need to, so it's always appropriate to come. But you may be seated for our prayer time. I'm going to use the Lord's Prayer as an outline for our prayer, so don't charge forward. Our Father who art in heaven, God, we acknowledge <laughs> your supremacy, your lordship, and that gives us hope. We are friends of the one who created all and the one who's orchestrated the future. So we don't need to be afraid. <laughs> We're in a pretty good place. Friends of God made possible through the work of Christ and our faith in him. We have friends in high places, Lord. You are God. You are worthy of praise regardless of what's happening in our lives and in our world. And we pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, we believe that day will one day come when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, when the curse will be over and there'll be peace, Lord. And those who have trusted Jesus will receive their great reward. But God, we're, we're praying for that day Day. We're praying for more of your kingdom to be present. We're praying for the end of war, the end of hatred. We're praying for true justice and mercy and love and righteousness and holiness, the values of heaven. Lord, fill us so full of your love that we can't contain it. Give us this day our daily bread. Not sure we'd be satisfied with that, but we acknowledge that every good and perfect gift comes from you. And most of us have more than we need, so may we be quick to share. But hear our prayers, Lord, for broken bodies. God, continue to heal Tori's shoulder. Touch Marcia with her rib issue. Be with Jen Taylor's mother. She despairs her health and all who need your touch today. God, hear our prayers for those we love and maybe ourselves today. Give us what we need, oh God, from your loving hand. Provide jobs and wisdom and comfort and strength. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lord, we're talking about that today. We cannot hold grudges. 
we cannot withhold forgiveness in light of what you've forgiven us. Oh God, if we've not lived well, if we've not been faithful to you, hear the prayers of repentance today. You're always listening for those cries, and we need to pray them, Lord. We don't have to sin, but sometimes the enemy convinces us, and we give in. So restore a pure heart within us in these moments, oh God, so we can come to the table later and celebrate the Lord's Supper. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God, we, we see the battle around us. I pray we do. There is a war going on for our souls, for our children, for decency and love. Protect us, O oh God. And protect us from those subtle compromises. Because that's how it starts. The enemy gets a foothold. Show us those way, the way of escape. God, may we pray and fast and seek you so that we may endure the times of testing so that we can shine like stars in the universe so that people can see you and be drawn to you. God, that's our prayer, that you'd use us to make yourself famous, that those we love would come to that moment where they humble themselves and turn from their sin and trust in Christ and are made new. God, use us, Lord. Use our upcoming services, Lord. Use our church plants. Raise up the workers that are needed for the road, Lord. May it be a great tool to reach our neighbors for Christ. And use us, God, wherever the road takes us to represent Jesus. And use this service, O oh God, to equip us, to fill us, to give us rest, to change us. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You're my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Amen. As pastor for a couple of minutes uh, this morning, just share something that uh, I think the Holy Spirit laid on my heart uh, this, this morning as I was thinking about it. And as one of the uh, elected leaders that you've um, chosen to kind of help us cast a vision, uh, your expectation, you know, understandably, is like, hey, we need you to help us figure out where we're going and cast a vision and seek the heart of the Lord. And um, that probably looks like many different things to many of the different leaders. If you asked each of us on the board, that probably looks a little different for each of us, even though we're all in agreement. Uh, but for me, personally, the the thing that the Lord laid on my heart this morning uh, was uh, our service uh, muscle in our life. And I just talk a little bit about service and the vision uh, that I think, or the identity that I, I think the Lord wants us to be about. And that is, you know, he draws he draw me to the scripture in Matthew where their uh, apostles are kind of arguing who's going to be first. He's like, I didn't come to be first. I came to serve. And so I think that's at the heart of who a Christ follower is, right? And I want to, there's a couple of different ways that leaders can help build that culture. Uh, that's one, uh, laying a challenge before you and saying this is an area that we may need to grow in. But also, I think leaders do, uh, one good leaders do is kind of pointing out who is modeling this for us appropriately and correctly. So the Lord laid that on my heart this morning, that as I've observed, uh, Gary Radens in his life, uh, you know, he's partnered us together in a lot of uh, situations. We, we share a journey group together, and of course, we partner together in, you know, providing this, this worship ministry. But um, one, Gary, I just want to say I appreciate you, and the Lord laid you on my heart this morning to just say any time that I call for Gary and say, hey, do you want to serve a meal with me? Do you want to help me? I need you. We need to come in a little early. Are you willing to? And the answer is always yes. Um, and to me, 
that is worth pointing out and sharing with you guys as, as somebody. I think we need to do that. So thank you, Gary. Um, I, it's a pleasure for me to serve the Lord uh, with you, and I truly feel that way. So that's what the Lord laid on my heart. I'm going to pray 15 seconds that he would challenge us. The other thing, sorry, the other thing is, so the care calendar, the vehicle that which we are caring for each other, right, is our care calendar. And I went out a couple of weeks ago, and I looked for, okay, who signed up for Meals for Recovery Church, um, which there's four spots every Friday. They, Recovery Church is in here, and we bless them by serving them a meal. And it takes about an hour to an hour and a half. Our journey group did it this last Friday. But I was a little concerned that it's empty for the most part. Um, and so I think what does success look like for us when it comes to serving is that that calendar is filled out always in the current month. We're never wondering, Recovery Church is never wondering, well, who's gonna, is there going to be a meal served? And, and there's funds to cover it, but... That shouldn't be a problem for us, in my opinion. Uh, so the Lord laid that on my heart. Uh, if you want to serve but you don't know how to get to the care calendar, we're working on making it more accessible to you. But you can always reach out to me, the office, pastor. Hey, I would like to serve a meal on Friday night. Um, can you help me do that? And we will help you do that, okay? So that's what the Lord laid on my heart is I think we can serve a little bit better in that capacity. And that's what success looks like. Uh, I'm going to pray for 15 seconds, maybe less, that the Lord would help us in that, and then we're going to transition to the message. God, I thank you for um, never leaving us to be content, Lord, that you lay a passion on our heart um, for whatever it is. There are many different ways that we can love you, uh, but Lord, you've given me a passion of service, and I thank you for the message that you've given me this morning. I pray that it's received in the manner in which it's given, which is full of love, and uh, Lord, I just thank you for who you are. You are worthy. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Jason, for leading well, being obedient. Um, my prayer this morning has been that the Holy Spirit would have free reign in our service, which scares us, you know, like he might do stuff we hadn't planned. Scares me anyway. <laughs> Jason texts me. It's like, okay, that's a start. And I, too, kind of sensed the Spirit's leadership in our, our music time, and maybe that's what he had in store. But he's been, uh, where's my, oh, there's my stool. <laughs> he's been talking to me all week about this message. I may even have to use some notes, because I've had, like, three rewrites and still don't know what I'm supposed to say. Um, I had it all done Thursday, you know, felt pretty good, and and then the Holy Spirit said Thursday night, that's not it. <laughs> that's what you want to say. It's not what I want to say. So uh, I've been trying to listen better. I'm committed to doing that. Even when it's not easy or fun. But let's see what he wants to say to us today. So uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 6. Again, we've spent some time there. Verses 37 through 49, and I invite you to stand for the reading, reading of the word. Luke 6, beginning with verse 37. That wasn't me today. I've been dropping stuff every week. <laughs> Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others, or it will all come back against you. Forgive others, and you will be forgiven. Give, and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. You've got to be careful of this one. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Then Jesus gave the following illustration. Can one blind person lead another? Won't they both fall into a ditch? Students are not greater than their teacher, but the student is fully, who is fully trained will become like the teacher. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying, friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. A tree is identified by its fruit. Figs are never gathered from thorn bushes, and grapes are not picked from bramble bushes. 
A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. So why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the flood waters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, It will collapse into a heap of ruins. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Did we get past the first line? Don't judge each other. We kind of like that. My wife's helping the children today, so I can talk about her. On the rare occasion when I catch her scarfing a candy bar... She'll shoot me this look, and usually accompany with words. Don't judge me. Jesus says it, right? We're off the hook. We, we don't have to be the moral police for each other, for the world. But I'm not quite so sure. The context is that He was talking to some judgmental people who probably found too much pleasure in, you know, thinking they were better than others. And that's kind of what judging does. When we point out someone else's flaws, we look better. That was their issue. You know, it's it's important to understand the context, not that we pull this verse out and say, well, this is a rule for life. We should never judge. They were judgmental. We are tolerant. I'm not sure which is worse. We've lost sight of the fact that there is right and wrong. And we can't ignore that. Love won't allow us to ignore that. So either extreme is always dangerous, hyper-judgmental, always being the moral police, but the other extreme is thinking, well, everything's okay. You do you, I'll do me. Do what makes you happy. That's bad advice for those who believe that this world isn't all there is. Full of grace and truth. Isn't that a great way to live, full of grace and truth, truth speaking. That's kind of behind, you know, at least this first part of the sermon that I hope won't take more than just a couple minutes, maybe five. You need to realize that stakes are pretty high. Jesus is still the only way to be saved, and a lot of people don't know that, and say, well, who am I to judge them? I wonder if they'll ask that question on that day when we're gathered around God's great white throne. Why didn't you tell me? (laughs) And I think abundant life is at stake for us. Too many Christians living mediocre lives, you know, making subtle compromises, settling for second or third best when God wants to Bless us and use us to bless others. Jesus came to give us an abundant, full, joyous life. And and I don't know if we're all living that. And again, love requires us to to say something, to do something, to, to get involved. That's how I see it. And right here, we have kind of the permission to judge each other. Paul writes to the Corinthians, it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it is certainly your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. How do we know if it's sin? Well, again, it's in the book. 
So I, need th- I think we need to be careful judging unbelievers. I-, I think that's kind of the word that, you know, we're to look out for each other. But I think what Jesus wants us to know, I-, I think the judging of unbelievers often is just, you know, going around telling people they're going to hell. And they probably are, but that's probably not going to help. <laughs> I've not seen it help often. And some people are called to do that. If God says that's what you're to do, then I can't tell you you're not. But to condemn someone, to say, you know, I, I, th- I thought of Jesus' words in Matthew uh, 5. If you call someone a fool... You're in danger of the fires of hell. That sounds extreme, but he's really saying, if you tell someone, there's no hope for you. You're such a bad person that God would never save you, right? You're reprobates, unredeemable. That's the line. That's condemnation. We we can't say that because there's hope for everyone. Amen? No one, I don't believe, has crossed that line can't write off people. There's hope. God is not willing that any perish. Jesus is willing to leave the 99 to go after the one. There's hope. We have a role to play, not going around telling people they're going to hell, but living exemplary, love-filled lives. Preach the gospel at all times. And if necessary, use words. Paul says similar things. I'm sorry, Peter does. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and will give honor to God when he judges the world. I mean, I hope they come to repentance before that day. Seek to influence unbelievers by your life. Be authentic, be loving, and when the opportunity presents itself, open your mouth, because how will they know if we never tell them, Paul says. So that's, that's half of the equation. The other half is, you know, judging each other, and, and that word judging just seems so scary, but I think we're to look out for each other. We're to spur one another on. Paul writes, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. Share with each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. Kind of informs how we should be treating each other, not going around saying, it's none of my business. If this person is not coming to church and, you know, leaving their spouse or (laughs) watching porn, you know, that's, you do you, I'll do me. We're in this together. Gently and humbly help each other. Not because we're, we got it all figured out, but because we love and want the best for each other. Confront with care. We coined this phrase in my last church. I introduced it to you at some point in the last 18 years. Care front instead of confront. We care front. We, we, we love each other. We want the best for each other. And it's like, hey, can we talk? I'm seeing things in your life that concern me. I don't want you to settle for second best. Don't give the devil a foothold because he's after all of us. Be vigilant. How can I help? Have you ever said any of those things to anyone? <laughs> it's time we start doing that. It's kind of, that's part of the vision of our journey groups to help each other live better, love better, we must check our motives. They informed by love. Is the Holy Spirit leading? And if so, 
we have to say something. So there's that. That was kind of the sermon. Oh, we really do need each other. Okay. We all have blind spots. We need correction. We all need correction, rebuke, and encouragement. What good are notes if I'm not going to look at them? All right, I got like five pages in. Okay. That was the message. That was what I wanted to share in a half hour and say a lot more. And I don't know. Holy Spirit said. He took me back to the text for the 20th time this week and, and said, this is, it's not just about judging. It's, it's about the kind of people we ought to be. It's about us, the kind of Christians we ought to be. And, and, and you could make these points. It's, they're not hard to find, but it's the word, and it's not going to return void. So I don't know, follow along in your sheet of paper or send me a text like you should have stayed in bed. But uh, the first one, actually, before this was we shouldn't be judgmental, right? What, what kind of Christians ought we to be? non-judgmental, full of grace and love. But then we get into verse 37b, forgive and you will be forgiven. I don't know if we're stuck there. I, I occasionally hear people say, I can forgive, I just can never forget. And I worry about those people, <laughs> you know. And I get that. I mean, you can't erase the hard drive, but, you know, are we holding people at arm's length? Because God wants our hearts to be open toward each other. He's been dealing with me about that. We can't hold grudges if we expect to be forgiven. Amen. All right. We should be generous. And not just so we get it back, although God's, God's a good giver. Bring your tithe into the storehouse. Test me in this and see if I won't open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing you won't have room enough to contain it. I mean, that's, that's the God we serve. We can't outgive God. But Jason brought a good word. I think we're a little stingy with our time and talents. Not getting enough nursery help. <laughs> Gary, he's an awesome guy, but he's, he and Larry are running the sound, and uh, we need some help. We need some help in our love. All right, generous. That's the kind of people we ought to be, and it's a fun way to live. When any time God says, hey, I need you to go do this, you say, yeah, count me in, because the blessings come back tenfold. All right. We ought to be teachable. Can a blind person lead another? Won't they both fall into a ditch? Students are not greater than their teacher, but the student who is fully trained will become like the teacher. Teachable, you know what that means? <laughs> We're humble enough to know we don't know it all. That's pretty important. To keep, you know crawling up into Jesus' lap and say, show me what you want me to see. Teach me how you want me to live. Form your character within me. Because I need help. I, I have a long way to go. <laughs> I may be entirely sanctified, but man, I have so far to go on this journey. So teach me your way teachable, so that we can teach others. Doesn't mean you have to know it all, right? Introspective. Don't love that word, but this is big, you know. We, we fuss at each other's hang-ups and ignore the big issues in our own lives. Hypocritical. <laughs> do what I say, not what I do. We 
need to be honest before God in ourselves. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is a good log detector. <laughs> And it only hurts for a moment. It's like uh, the Band-Aid, you know. Ouch! But then comes relief and healing. You know, when he has disciplined us, when he has helped us put childish ways behind us so we can be of greater use to each other, it's beautiful. Again, I... I'm afraid the enemy says, well, you have no business speaking into this person because of this issue in your life. And I guess there's some truth to that. We can't ignore the issue, but if we haven't completely figured it all out and surrendered it completely, it doesn't mean we're useless in helping each other. It's, it's together, I think. We, we follow Jesus better, spur one another on, encourage each other, hold each other accountable. But start with your own heart. That's, that's why we need this six-week journey between now and Easter. Because God wants to do something in our hearts so he can do something through us. I keep wondering, why aren't more things happening in our church? And I think this is it. We're not yielded to him. We're not surrendered to him. He, he's got some deep work to do in us before he can do his work through us. Maybe that's what he wanted me to say today. I'm winging this, by the way. All right. Fruitful. <laughs> Got that passage about, you know, good trees produce good fruit, bad trees produce bad fruit. You're, you all look like good trees to me. <laughs> but there should be evidence in our character, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. The fruit of the Spirit should be growing in us. And I do believe that when we are connected with Christ, the people around us should be moving toward him. We may not you know, win people to Jesus, may not pray the prayer of salvation, but we should see progress in our family members and friends, the people we're praying for, there should be movement toward Jesus. The walls start coming down, the hearts start opening up. How do we do that? By abiding in Christ. That's what Jesus tells us in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain, abide in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Are we abiding in Jesus? Spending time with him, enjoying his presence, letting his life and love flow through us. That's what he wants. And last, the last little bit of this chapter, then we can move on. <laughs> Obedience. What kind of people ought we to be? What kind of Christians? It should be pretty obvious. People who hear and obey. We follow it. We're not like people who look at ourselves in the mirror then forget what we look like. Jesus says things to us, and it makes a difference in our lives. It's the kind of people that we ought to be, the kind of Christians that God wants to reproduce in our world. But we let him. Here's the good news, in case you're leaving beat up today. That the God who calls us is faithful, and he will do it. It's not just up to me to man up and figure it out. 
you know, I come to him and say, God, do in me what I can never do myself. And he does it. He's faithful. Lord, we thank you for loving us enough to get in our face. (laughs) Probably not the funnest day in church for us while our kids are (laughs) playing upstairs, but you're a good, good father. And you see what we can become when we say yes to you, God. And it's good. Our world needs Christians like that, full of grace and truth, generous, obedient, fruitful. God, we want to be like that. We want to be like Jesus. And that's what you do. When we gather together, when we study your word, when we gather in journey groups, when we open the Bible, when we pray, when we come to the table, your grace flows and we're changed, God. And it is beautiful, Lord, that you are at work, but when we yield ourselves, when we take our hands off the wheel, it goes so much better. (laughs) I just thank you for your faithfulness, the hope we have that he who began a good work within us will be faithful to complete it. Amen. Amen. So we come to the table with hearts open wide for what he wants to pour into us today. We have uh, some gluten-free elements here. You're welcome to come grab them. I always forget to distribute, but feel free to come up. And the rest can reach forward into the chair uh, in front of you and take the elements. Hold them until I've uh, read the liturgy and and given the instructions. The communion supper instituted by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is a sacrament which proclaims his life, his sufferings, his sacrificial death and resurrection, and the hope of his coming again. The supper is a means of grace in which Christ is present by by the Spirit. It is to be received in reverent appreciation and gratefulness for the work of Christ. All those who have truly repented of their sins are invited to partake in the death and resurrection of Christ. We come to the table that we may be renewed in life and salvation and be made one by the Spirit. God, we thank you for your love and your gift of salvation. Through your son, Jesus Christ, we thank you for his obedience to death on the cross, for his broken body and shed blood that he took the wrath of God for us. We are thankful enough to offer our lives that you've rescued and redeemed back to you as living sacrifices that is a reasonable response, our act of worship. It's our desire, so help us today as we receive these elements in your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pull off the cellophane top and take out the wafer representing the body of our Lord 
Let's take the bread together. The body of our Lord broken for you. May it preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Let's eat this together. Peel back the foil halfway and consider the blood of Christ shed for you. May it preserve you blameless under everlasting life. Drink this with grateful hearts. Thanks be to God. Let's stand and sing that old hymn, may or may not be familiar, as the ushers pick up the elements. I have one deep, supreme desire. That I may be like Jesus To this I fervently aspire That I may be like Jesus I want my heart is thrown to so that a watching world may see his likeness shining forth in me. I want to be like Jesus. Amen. It's your prayer, isn't it, Angie? And I hope many of you say, that's what I want. The God who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. I hope you'll stick around for a journey group to process what the Lord is saying to you today. Because we need help from our brothers and sisters in Christ. And don't forget about the offering. I, I think we failed to mention it, but I think you know the drill. Um, if you're on our live stream, there are multiple ways of giving, doesn't look like we have that slide handy, but continue to bring your tithe into the storehouse and God will bless you for it. Receive the benediction as you go. May the God of peace sanctify you through and through so that your whole body, soul, and spirit will be found blameless when he comes again. The God who calls you is faithful. And he will do it. Amen. Go in peace.